Look at everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Yeah, my my dark room's echoing back here. <laughs> That's kind of funny. It's all empty. It's weird. There it is. No rotating door. Everything's gone. All the stuff's coming down. What a what a what a job. I I do not like a moving house, as they say, but the necessary evil, right? So welcome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's streaming on YouTube, too. Cheers, everybody. Hope you're having a good morning, afternoon, evening. I'm still drinking my coffee. Let's see how this stuff works. I'm not even sure how to how to add people. Hey, look at that. Those, yeah. How cool is that? <laughs> Very neat. That's awesome. Welcome to StreamYard. The newest kid on the block, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I go from thing to thing and try to find out where everybody's at and what they're doing um, technology-wise to make these things a little bit easier. So that is very cool. I like it. Um, I'm not sure. Can I do a screen share? Yeah, I can. That's very cool. Hello, Peter B. Uh, yeah, so we, we've, got, uh, we've got a few people. And um, we can go ahead and, and start our – and the chat's open. So anybody watching this on YouTube or Facebook is streaming on both platforms. So it should be pretty uh, pretty good for that. Um, uh, how? What? Could, let me see what I can do here. Yeah, okay. Wow, they give you all kinds of setups. Look at this. How sexy is this, huh? <laughs> boom, 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 all over the place. So, so welcome. Um, I just had a guy in the Czech Republic this morning um, ask about uh, books, and he, he got one. I'm down. I'm coming to the wire. Everything's changing. I say this every time, but this is the only thing I kind of advertise here is my book. It's relevant to what we speak about, talk about. I have a few of those left up in the cupboard. Um, I'm going to officially say June 10th is the last time or the last day I'm actually going to be able to offer those. So if you're interested, grab one of them. I appreciate the support from everybody doing all that kind of stuff. So join in if you can in the festivities. And uh, and we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, whatever topics interest you. I have, um, I have so many things I could talk about. Lately, I've been um, with this COVID thing, I've been doing a lot of backtracking about um, death and death denial and death anxiety, um, mostly the Ernest Becker stuff. And I was thinking, I just got back from uh, grocery shopping. Good morning, G. McGee. Good to see you. I just got back from grocery shopping and, you know, everybody's their mask and gloves and all that stuff. Most people, not everyone. Um, and it just fills your head with those ideas and those thoughts about um, death and dying and getting sick and what we're going through and all that. Now, as, as I was, we were driving back, I was thinking, you know, at the end of the day, we think our photography or whatever we do in our lives or all of this stuff is so meaningful and so enriching. And, and it probably is for, for the illusion that we live in. But at the end of the day, it's all meaningless, right? We just die we, we go back to wor wor food for the worms and the animals and the earth or whatever, the soil, 100, 200 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, we're forgotten. It's just kind of meaningless, right? But that's what the idea behind Becker's position is, is if we think that way, we'd be curled up in a ball over there in the corner, would never do anything. We'd just, we, it, it's a absolutely paralyzing. And what Sheldon Solomon talks about um, in his Worm at the Core, in his book, Worm at the Core, he talks about TMT, terror management theory. And it's a whole theory based on, he's a social, social psychologist, and it's a whole theory based on how human beings deal with meaning and purpose in life, and moreover, how we deal with death anxiety. And so what I talk a lot about is, is it like for us, we use photography or a form of art to um, shield that death anxiety, to alleviate the anxiety of, of, of our mortality, knowing that we're going to die. We create projects, that, uh, Becker calls them immortality projects. We publish books, we make artwork, we make photographs, we paint, we sculpt, um, whatever it is we do, right, that, that will allow us to live on, right? Um, 
that old cliche of middle-aged crazy. There's a there's a Jungian psychologist called uh, Dr. Um, James Hollis, and he wrote a book called The Middle Passage, and he talks about most of us know is middle age, most of us know the theory of middle-aged craziness, right? And that deals with part of this. Um, the whole, you know, the 55-year-old guy with the 25-year-old chick on his arm in the Corvette, and he's getting his hair done, and he's, you know, his nails, and he's, you know, he's trying to earn a bunch of money, and he's, he's trying to hold on to youth. You know, women do it too, but um, Hollis talks about in the middle passage, he talks about what, what I'm trying to apply in my life at 56 years old now. I'm trying to apply the idea of entering the second phase of my life in a uh, in a more uh, positive way, a more um, I'm re re inventing my life in a, in a lot of ways. Right, photography allows me to do that. Projects allow allow me to do that. But all all the time, I know I know what I'm doing. I'm trying to stave off the death anxiety. I know death is coming. Every everywhere we look, everything we see. Um, Death is knocking on our door. Pre-COVID-19, you'd see a car accident. Boom, death is in your mind. You'd see uh, someone die of cancer or hear someone, boom, death is in your mind. You know that's waiting for you. So we're really fearful. We're, it, it, it creates a lot of anxiety in us. So we need to do things that stave that off. And art and photography is one of the big things that, that we do to, to stave those things off. So I find it fascinating. I don't know. I'm a... I'm an armchair psychologist. I love uh, the old Greek philosophers. I love thinking about purpose, and meaning, um, reason, um, trying to find. That's where we kind of, you know, last week I talked about laying it, that meaning over into your work and creating projects and um, and uh, those kinds of those kinds of issues and. Hello, Linda. Hello, Sam. Let me see if I can get some more people in here. I don't. Someone is trying to enter the studio, but the studio is full. Wow, that's a king's problem to have. The studio can only hold ten people. That's okay. Um, people can still watch this stuff. Um, sorry. Let's see. Let's see if I can add any more people. Oh, can I add uh, six people on screen? Look, add them all. Why? Just give us all of them. Why can't we just put everybody in here? So what do you guys want to talk about today? Do you want to talk about some technical stuff? Do you want to show some work? Do you want to, what do you want to do? I'm game to look at anything, talk about anything. I just had that, you know, going out in the world, I just had that death anxiety on my mind again. <laughs> Could we talk quickly Quinn. about paper? Quinn. Yes. Who's this? Uh, Jan. It's, uh, Jan. It's on, uh, oh, Jan. If it's free, it's, it's a limit on uh, six people. Okay, that's all right, uh, but everybody can see it. Um, yeah, we can chat about burrito paper. Yes, yes, I see your chat now. Okay, yeah, six people, but you know what? As people come and go, they can still watch it. They can just hang out and watch it, and then when a space frees up, they can jump in, or if somebody wants to, you know, uh, you can always watch it. There's no problem. Uh, it's streaming on YouTube and Facebook right now, so maybe a 10-second delay or something. But let's talk about burrito paper, uh, Peter. What do you want to talk about? Let's let's shoot that up there. That's a good topic. I, I'm not sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Cool. Hi, hi everybody. Um, Quinn, I got some proper burrito paper during the week and um, done some prints on it. So it's uh, maybe you can see. Uh, Beautiful. Okay. So it's quite cool. Okay. So um, this is not burrito paper. This is uh, uh, Archer's uh, Aquile or or I can't pronounce it, but it's Archer's watercolor paper. Um, I kind of like the warmness of it. Okay. Um, okay. It plays havoc with the toner, with the gold toner. It just kills it. What, whatever, whatever is you're using in it to size it, it yeah. just, it's just killing the toner. And I've, um, I mean, that's another one there. So I mean, it's, it's, there's a, the, there's a beautiful warmth to it. Right. Boy, there's that is. I, I I love that. I love that color. I love that that feel. Yes. Okay. So my question is: Do we know of a paper, a burrito paper, um, which doesn't have any bleed through on the back? Like, I mean, it's it's a beautiful paper to work with. But does is there any burrito paper that will give me that warmth, or is there another way to give me that warmth of image or that yes. a cone of image without? Um, uh, yeah, it, it's it's it's. 
Yeah. 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 Uh, Peter, you're absolutely right. Toner can, or uh, certain papers can really raise hell with your uh, with your toner. Uh, remember, everything you put in toner is going to um, intermix, and any metallics, anything like that's what it does. It bonds with the silver, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to come out with uh, you're, you're going to come out with an image that um, is bound up and uses your gold chloride out of that toner. Um, let me show you a paper, and if, if you if you haven't tried this, I get, I encourage you to try this paper. Let me see where I'm at. Let me share my screen here. Share screen. Yes. Uh, can I share that screen here? I'm I'm new I'm new to Streamyard, so bear with me here. Uh, application window Chrome tab. Let's try that. There we go. Oh, that's nice. So can you guys see that? Um, this is a Canson or Canson product. Yep. Um, I like this uh, Prestige paper right here. Yep. That's Canson um, Prestige. Is that the one you used? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, there's another, there's a couple of them here. Um, this uh, photographic, um, did you notice here, um, this paper here, satin finish. Hey, I got a question. When you use the Canson paper, did you notice a, uh, am I back here? Did you notice a milky substance coming off the back of the paper? No. Okay. That you're using the Prestige, and that's, yeah. the Prestige um, has probably the, um, the surface texture is a little different, and, and the, the photographic, I have both here. I actually like the texture of the Prestige. But there's also um, uh, the the photographic is is warmer. What okay. color? What color were you getting with that? Which show it, us the press again? It, it, it's almost a neutral gray, which yeah. is it's something I don't want. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I prefer. I mean, it, it, if I if I can get as, as close to that as possible. Yes, uh, we, freestyle. We Let me see if I can get uh, here. Um, Peter, what paper was? This is Archer's. Um, Let me see. Yeah, Art. Yeah, that's. I, I love that. But you're right. Yeah. Um, oh, you may have to play right. around with some of those to get the right. Uh, let me see. It it'll just go through your toner, though. So be careful. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. That is very true. So there's another one, and let me just pull you over here. I know. I know this is an American um, store, so but I, I, you'll be able to see the the uh, papers here. Hannah Mule, Hannah Mule Photo Rag Burrito. This is uh, this is actually sheets. This is yeah, these are huge sheets, but you can get it in smaller. Um, this is a really nice paper as well too. Um, the the Hannah Mule, I've used Hannah Mule sent me samples. Of this photo rag, uh, there's uh, there's a couple of different um, burrito papers in the Hannah Mule line. I recommend getting some samples of those and trying those because everything's going to be a little bit different. What kind? Of, my second question for you, Peter. What yeah. kind of gold toner are you using? Uh, are, you I, using the, I, are you using the chemical or the borax? Uh, it's just a ready-made technical, and um, I switched over to Berger. And I'm getting a better result with the Berger rather than the Tetanol. Okay, here's what I recommend people doing. Tetanol is gone. The Tetanol gold, gold toner will no longer be is no longer being made. So here's what I recommend people doing is buying one gram of gold chloride, and you can get gold chloride pretty much at any Photoshop. One gram will be 35 to 45 US dollars, it depends. Take eight grams of borax, eight grams of borax. Take one liter of distilled water, heat up about half of that to about 40 degrees, 42, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Put your borax in and dissolve that. Put your gold chloride in and top it off with distilled water. That's gold tone, borax gold toner. That will function much better on the papers you're trying to use rather than the... Um, the, the, the chemical compound in the the, the uh, cyanate toners, what you're using. You're okay. using a, 
a, a hardcore like a tetanol or a berger. I think berger's the cyanate as well, gold cyanate. I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. um, try the gold tone borax gold tone. I think you'll I think you'll find it a much better um, a much better re much better results. Okay, cool. Um, oh. <laughs> Uh, let's see. John says, I haven't started, but looking forward to start. Good, John. Question is, I live where I can get 120 degrees during the summer. That's Fahrenheit, by the way, not Celsius. Um, 120 degrees during the So how, here's a question. What is the humidity in 120 degrees? Do you have low humidity? Where are, where are you, John? Where are you located? I live in, uh, out by Palm Springs in California. Oh. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> You're right. And that 120 is probably going to get a little bit hotter as the time goes on. Um, yeah. Fortunately, you don't have any humidity. You just have the heat. So this is what I recommend. I have a Coleman blue cooler. Mm -hmm. And I've heard Yetis are really good, too, for this. I I, I don't have one. I, I'm kind of a cheapie that way. But I have a Coleman blue cooler, a big one. I don't know if it's a 80 quart or 60 quart. It's, it's large. It's a big one. It's right under my desk right here. Um, I, in the summertime, I can get up over a hundred degrees Fahrenheit easily, 40, 42 degrees Fahrenheit uh, Celsius here. No problem, but it's dry. So what I do is I get the ice blocks, the blue freezer ice blocks, freeze up a half a dozen or 10 of those put them in my cooler, get my cooler really cooled down, put the, the ice blocks back in the freezer for a couple of hours, load my chemistry up and put my uh, blue ice in there and close up the, the cooler. Now, the question is when you're out, you've got to fill your silver tank bath up, you've got your developer out, that kind of stuff, and it's going to absorb or become uh, start regulating with the ambient temperature. So if you bring your chemistry down to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, 10, 15 degrees Celsius, somewhere in there, and then you pull it out and fill your bath up, and over an hour or two, you're only going to rise up to maybe 80, 85 degrees, maybe, maybe 28, 30 degrees Celsius. Then what you'll have to do, if you want to keep making plates at that point, you'll have to dump that back in your bottle, put it back in your cooler, and take that temperature back down without any adverse effects. The developer, you can leave in your cooler. The fix doesn't really matter. I mean, you don't want it 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but the fix won't really matter. Um, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to regulate the temperature of your substrate. You don't want your glass or tin types or metal sitting out in the sun or, or getting up to 120 degrees and pouring collodion on it. You can regulate your collodion by taking it out of the cooler and pouring it. The big thing is your silver bath. You want to regulate that temperature as much as you can. And if you can have it between... You know, ideally 68 degrees, 20 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius, you know, maybe 78, 80 degrees, somewhere in there. That's where you're going to be fine. Um, on the flip side is the cold weather. Um, I was doing a job for Levi Strauss down here in a ranch in southern Colorado. And it was in December, the first of December. And it was minus three degrees Fahrenheit or minus six degrees Fahrenheit in the morning. I actually had to use my Coleman catalytic heater and put my developer in water and do kind of like a double uh, boiler to keep that developer. My ice in my, my, my water and my wash trays were icing up and scratching the emulsion off the plates. There's, there's issues to deal on both sides. Most of the time, I would say, unless you're really forced to do it or you're a glutton for punishment, I would wait for better weather or yeah. shoot in the times a year that, that it's more comfortable, both for the process and for yourself. So if you live in a, a climate, a mountain climate like we do here, I don't make many photographs in the winter time. Some sometimes I do. It just depends, and and I don't really make a lot of photographs in the summertime, in the peak of the summer, because it's so hot and the 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 light is not really good. You know, the sun's right over you. It's, it's just not really ideal. I mean, I I have and I do, but I like the spring and the fall here. I like to work in temperatures. You know, like I said, between 20 degrees Celsius, 68 degrees Fahrenheit to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in there is ideal. If that's your ambient temperature and you don't have wind, you can set up your uh, dark room or dark box under a tree or in some shade or something. Man, you can you can go all day and your chemistry will perform just great. But those are some of the ideas. Ice blocks, cooler, and keep that silver bath. That's the biggest one. 
keep that silver bath and don't let your substrate. I, I've seen people sit their substrate out in the sun. They pick up, oh, it's so hot they can't pour it on. And then they get it down to where they can pour it and they pour collodion on it and that temperature difference, it'll crack. It'll, it messes with chemistry. It dries stuff out quickly. So you have to manage that. Those old boys in the 19th century all over the world surely did that. Yeah. What about storing um, the chemistry just on an ongoing basis? Yeah, storing chemistry. That's another great question. Um, I know there's not a lot of folks out there that are, that are a stickler on safety and handling and storage of chemistry because they think, oh, everybody makes too big of a deal out of it. Well, wait until you have something blow up or, you know, you, you poison your dog or God forbid your wife or neighbor, anybody, right? I mean, it's serious and you want to store them and handle this stuff correctly. And one of the things you need to do in long-term storage, the silver bath, the dry powder chemicals, um, uh, the, the, the varnish, if you have it mixed, uh, for the most part, all of those are really stable, right? What we have to watch out for is the collodion and the raw ether. And those are the, what we're really talking about is the ether and the nitrocellulose. Not so much the nitrocellulose, but more the ether. And when I talk about storage of ether, what I talk about is once you open a bottle or a can of ether and oxygen can get in there, it starts oxidizing. And over a long period of time, ether and oxygen can form peroxides. Peroxides are highly explosive. If you read Dangers in the Dark, and I think we posted it here before on previous shows, uh, Bill Jay, he's, he's died now, but wonderful photo writer. He, he documented all most of the deaths in the 19th century in photography. And uh, he talks about the number one cause of death in the 19th century in photography were explosions. And we've talked about that before. And a lot of that's to do with, they had pot wood burning stoves. They didn't have contained furnaces. They had, you know, all kinds of problems using candles, all kinds of stuff that um, wasn't so great for this process. And mainly because of the ether. Ether is highly explosive, highly flammable, nitrocellulose even more so. Or, or as much, but the ether, you want to stabilize that ether. So you open up a bottle of ether, you mix up your collodion. What I recommend doing is mix it, taking your 500 mils of ether or your liter of ether, how much ever you buy, use it all up and make iodizer. That's your salts and your solvents mixed together. And if you read about it in my book, that stuff is stable. It stabilizes the ether. Alcohol is a great stabilizer for ether, by the way, keeps those peroxides from forming. You get rid of the danger of storing that raw ether and you have iodizer ready to go to mix your chemistry whenever you want. The second part of that, once you make your iodizer, you want to store it properly. And when I talk about storage, I talk about a dark, cool place. A dark, cool place, meaning light and heat exacerbates oxidation and chemical reactions in these, in these compounds and chemistry chemicals. So dark meaning no, no light, especially no UV light, if you can do that, right? So cooler's great again, um, a downstairs, a, a garage that's sectioned off or whatever, that's a great area. And when I talk about cool, I mean 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius or lower, ideally. You could go up again to around 80 degrees Fahrenheit without any real problems. But in a perfect world, if you want to draw the length of your chemistry out in storage and be safe about it, those are the things that I would recommend. The biggest thing is stabilizing the ether. That's just because once you open that can of ether, bottle of ether up, oxygen gets in, and we don't know how long it takes to form peroxides in ether. Um, I've read stories of old chemistry labs in high schools where 30 years uh, ago, somebody shoved a bottle of opened ether back in the back shelf and they discover it and there's there's peroxides all over, around the lid of it and highly, highly explosive. I mean, it's just, it's there. It's like silver fulminate, right? It's like, uh, anybody ever had those little, uh, uh, they look like little Casper the ghost paper pops, you throw them, they're rock pops and they hit and they explode. That's how volatile it is. That, that There's a tiny fraction of that stuff in there. So I recommend people read the MSDS or SDS sheets on all the chemistry know what you're dealing with. Back in the day when I first started, I actually, where I lived at the time, I actually had the fire department come over and, and scan my stuff. I had all my MSD sheets out. I had poison control on the line if I needed it. I wanted them to know if I had an accident there or a fire, I wanted them to know what I was dealing with. I'm not, 
I'm not a buy the book guy all the time. That way I, I, I don't look to authority figures that much, but I do, I am concerned with safety and I know about these, these chemicals and compounds. I've worked with them long enough. And there's just too many people on the internet that are just too lackadaisical. They're just too, I've read it over the years. They come and go, you'll see them chime in and come in and say, you know, they're an expert after a couple of few years in this and they know about all this stuff and then they go away somewhere, right? They just come and go, come and go. That's not, you know, for the most part, what people say is people worry too much about handling and storage of chemicals and they're not that dangerous. You know, if you were my buddy and you hung around me a lot and, and you worked with me in my studio or my dark room and, and went out in the field with me, I'd probably have a little bit of a conversation that way with you. But after 20 years in this, after talking to many chemists, after studying the stuff, after looking at the compounds, after reading all the safety data on them and the changing compounds and the interaction with everything, um, if you get to that point, you can feel comfortable with them. But it doesn't mean that I'm lax about ether or huffing ether, ventilation. You know, when we talk about breathing in collodion, we're really talking about breathing in ether. I talked a few times ago about um, people saying, uh, they'll email me, my wife says my beard smells like collodion. You know, that means that this person, uh, male, of course, if he has a beard, I, I guess he's male, I don't know, um, but that, that ether absorbed into the hair, right? And that's off gassing and people can smell it in your clothes. That tells you you're not well, well enough ventilated using this stuff. I've seen people crawl in their dark box and pour plates, you know, thinking that they can't pour a plate without red light and stuff like that. And we're all ignorant of things. That's just the lack of education. But that lack of education can be very dangerous. Uh, I've seen people stick their fingers down into cyanide fix and stuff. And I just, I err, as my attorney tells me to, as publishing books on this stuff for many years. I am liable to some degree legally, and we're, we live in a very legal, litigious community, as a culture. I am liable to some degree about people using my books and my expertise and then having an accident. I, I, I don't stay up at night about that, but when I see something online about somebody just being flippant about safety with these chemicals, it, it bothers me. And then there's the whole environmental side of it too. So there's, there's a lot of um, avenues to travel down. Be safe, number one, be safe. Keep yourself safe, your your family, your animals, your neighbors, whatever you're working around, and to have fun. You don't have to be so crazy about it that you don't enjoy it. It's 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 doable. I've talked about having my blood tested every year at my physical, checking for uh, cadmium and checking for mercury. I worked with daguerreotypes for a while, um, and and I'm fine. I, I've mitigated all that. Cat handling cadmium, my liver tests uh, for ether. Um, all that stuff. And, and you know, I have to admit, though, I'm a little more pre uh, conscious of it. My wife is, was trained up and has a degree in safety engineering. She's an industrial or was an industrial hygienist. So I have a little bit of resource to pull on my own experience, uh, learning, taking in information, continuing learning about it. But it's a great subject. And I do not downplay it at all, because the last thing we need in this community is someone getting hurt or, God forbid, killed or fire or any anything, any injury, any of that stuff, it would throw a big, big damper on the whole community. And I've even heard talk of um, old boys dying of uh, even modern age in the 20th and 21st century, people working in the process and ended up dying of cancer, or liver issues and things like that. And I wonder, you know, if they correlated this stuff. So be safe, have fun, but be safe. And listen to about that much stuff online that you hear. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. I, I know I get ranting about that, especially after I have a couple of cups of coffee. But um, Jan, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed that, that photograph. I sent Jan a Clodio chloride print. Um, that is actually on... Uh, that is actually on the canson that I just showed in the, in the shared link. Um, Maybe you can hold that. I don't know how do. There you go. How do we? Uh, how do we enlarge these screens? Does anybody know how to do this on, on? I, I when I click this, it, it blows me up, and I don't want to blow me up. I want to blow um, Jan up. There. If you could see that, if that light balance on that was right, uh, Peter, you would be able to see that's got that warm color to it. 
And that's toned in gold borax toner that I was talking about. So keep that in mind. Thanks for sharing that, Yon. I'm, I'm glad you like it. It's a uh, it's just a little bit of information. I, I do some people like to get, Quinn, can I get those prints? Can, you know, I want to get one of those. Prints. And I just, I try to throw them in books or send them out or whatever I can do when I, when I can, you know, what am I going to do? Yes. Okay. Uh, Kareem says there are two types of gold chloride. Yep. Uh, type one and HC, which one? Should, what the first one? AUCL3. Actually, that should be AUCL, gold chloride. And sometimes I use a category one. Um, let me let me pull up a screen, guys, and I want to show you. I'll show you where I get my gold chloride um, from my buddy Mike at Artcraft. I'm just going to pull his uh, uh, metals up here, metal salts. I think it's under metal salts. I would imagine it is. Give me just a second here. Uh, Iranian plate. Oh, maybe not. Uh, let me just search for gold chloride. And I haven't, I bought two or three grams last time I purchased it. So I'm not sure it again, just like silver, right? We're subject to the market value of this. Let's see what it is here. I'll pull this up. There we go. Continue reading. Let me share the screen here. Oh, $45 a gram us uh, share screen, Chrome tab, gold chloride share. There we go. So there it is. Um, it's gold chloride solid, one gram. Oh, it doesn't really doesn't really have any more information on that. But gold chloride is usually AUCL gold chloride, and sometimes I'll designate it uh, with a number one, but um, a lot of times not. Um, but that's the one you want is is the AUCL. And the and some borax. Borax is very inexpensive. It's a buffer. Borax is an alkaline base um, compound. It's a buffer, and it will allow. Yeah, uh, is the gold is the borax gold toner recipe just described for chlorine chloride? Yes. Uh, he, uh, Dr Drew is asking, is it good for chlorine chloride, salt, albumin, all of them? Any pot paper, it is good for. What you're doing with gold toning is you're submerging. You're putting the print in the silver chloride print into the gold chloride, the borax is acting as a buffer. And what happens is that little bit of exchange there, you come up with an amalgam of gold and silver. Very archi archival, changes the grain structure a little bit and changes the color of the print as well too, usually. So a good gold toner, a couple of minute tone will give you a, a kind of the warm brown color that Peter was showing and that Jan was just showing on the Clodia chloride print there that I sent him. And you could go all the way three to 10 minutes, something like that, between three and 10 minutes, depending on the strength, the size of the print, et cetera, et cetera, temperature, humidity, all that stuff or even plays a role, or temperature rather, uh, plays a role in it. But up to like 10 minutes, you can go to this like gun steel black, like this kind of, you know, just, just, just blue and black kind of color on the print. So gold toning is timed. Any pot print, I prefer now, because I can't get the other stuff anyway, I prefer the borax gold tone, uh, and I bought a few grams to take to the mountain with me when I get set back up. That, and that's what I've been using um, here for a while. Um, I, I use the last liter of tetanol that I have. I think I might have a half a liter of tetanol left, but it's packed up now. So, yes, you can uh, use that on wait. anything. Yes. I, I, I can buy uh, a 50 milliliter, uh, 1% uh, gold chloride. 50 milliliter? Yes, yeah, from Sweden, 50 milliliter of 1%. Of 1%, so, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so what we're talking about is we're talking about one gram of gold chloride in one liter. So that's 0.1%, right? Am I correct about that, math? So do the equation there. If they've diluted the gold, gold chloride down already, just do the math and make the adjustments. But gold chloride, distilled water, and borax, you have a great uh, gold tone, borax gold tone for pot prints. It's absolutely stunning, absolutely beautiful. Just play with a particular print, the particular paper, like Peter was talking about, times and temperatures, and how much you use that gold. Just like silver, every time you put a print in there, it's going to take some gold out of your solution. So over time, you're going to replace this stuff. And if you have funky stuff on the paper, or if you have... You know, there's a whole gold, that stuff will bind up and use it up. So 
be careful. Um, a leader, people ask me this quite often, um, a leader of, of Gorak, Borax Gold Tone, that's easy for me to say, a leader of that particular solution would do <clears throat> between 25 and 35 eight by 10 prints, 25, I'll say 25 eight by 10 prints. Sometimes if you're, you know, again, that's just the initial tone, two or three minute tone to get, get a little bit of archival quality, get a little bit of that nice warm color to it and pull it out. Probably do half of that if you went three to, to five minutes or five to 10 minutes, probably do half of that, maybe 10 or 12 prints. It just depends. So that's about roughly what you can expect out of a leader. But <clears throat> not only is it aesthetic, it's beautiful. You get that up that archival quality. And especially that's why albumin prints were always gold tone because th that archival ability on, on albumin prints is just not there. They fade and yellow and it, they're just, they're tough prints to work with. Um, 1% 50 mil AU is enough for five liters, I hope. Um, I'd have to do the math on that, Dion. I, it, it might be. Yeah, 1%. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I think so. Who's good at public math? Hey, Peter, nice to see you, bud. Yes, drop in anytime. Um, welcome, welcome. So, so uh, <laughs> there he is. Uh, thanks for chiming in on that, Kareem. That's that's great on the gold chloride because it's a little confusing on which gold chloride to get. But Jan, I think you're you're right. You'll have to experiment and and do the math. Um, but look at uh, look at uh, the, take the the base solution of 0.1 percent of gold chloride is is what your liter is because you're putting one gram of gold chloride into a liter. A thousand mils of distilled water, and then and you have eight grams, or a 0.8 percent buffer or alkaline of, of borax in there, and it's beautiful. I, I recommend it, um, and not only do I recommend it, you're not going to get the other te uh, uh, cyanate toner anymore anyway. So you're going to have to use it if you want to tone, and of course you want to tone. What else do we have? Who else do we have? What do you want to talk about? Um, I add anybody else. We've got a couple of people watching on the sidelines. That's okay. That's that's fine. I've never used StreamYard before, so this is uh, should be streaming out nicely. Let's see comments. Um, anyone know how to find borax in Europe? Uh, Samuel, that, it's it's very. Um, uh, <laughs> my my streamy yard is full. Borax is very easy to find. Borax is a very common uh, cleaner. Um, you can actually use it. It's kind of like gelatin. You can kind of actually, we have a mule, <coughs> excuse me, a mule borax here that I actually use it in blacksmithing and bladesmithing. You use borax when you're powder welding steel, heat it up, the steel up in the forge. If you have layered steel, heat it up in the forge, sprinkle it with borax. And it keeps the uh, iron, the scaling or the oxidation of prevents oxygen from getting between the steel, so you don't have cold shots, um, that kind of thing. That's a different topic, though. <laughs> but I use bar. I use a lot of these products in photography and bladesmithing and blacksmithing. It's crazy. It's interchangeable. I use Renaissance wax sometimes to do prints, like salt prints and stuff, and collodion. And I use Renaissance wax to 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 put on my blades. It's it's, it's kind of nice. Sodium tetraborate, but they close at the moment due to COVID. Oh, oh, Phil. I'll, if I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll find somebody. Somebody in Europe's got borax. There's, there's just cannot be um, an issue there. Borax is just so readily available. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, I think Bostic and Sullivan even have, can ship into London or some something like that. But if anybody finds borax in Europe, uh, let us know, and we'll. Uh, We'll turn Phil onto it. So what else, guys? What do we have here? Let's talk about something fun. What do we want to talk about? Any more questions? Any Anything? Take? Those are good. The paper and the toning, really good stuff. Um, those are very common questions. It can be uh, chemistry storage is always a big one. You can never reiterate that enough just to keep people safe and and, and have fun, of course. We want to have fun. We don't want to be a buzzkill about it. We And we don't want to be overkill with it. We don't want to, you know, scare people. Oh, my God. I'm not – I hear people all the time saying, 
oh, I don't want ad an additional ether and I don't want cadmium. And, and I said, that's fine. That's that's perfectly okay. If you, if you don't want to use those products, do not use them. But sometimes you push that a little too far and we find out that what's under our kitchen sink is probably just as deadly as what, what we're using in, in making chemistry. So uh, just Quinn, be conscious. Uh, when uh, cadmium is in the liquid, in the collodium, ether and alcohol, it's not so dangerous because it's in the liquid. Exactly, Jan. Uh, again, um, what the, the, the idea behind the ether, what we're trying to do is stabilize it, meaning prevent it from oxidizing and forming peroxides. And now you ha you've got my book. Look in there and you'll read about peroxides. And I even put a little test in there with the potassium iodide. You can check your ether to see if you have if it's oxidized, right? It, you don't need to. I mean, this is this is a little overkill, but if you wanted to. So the idea is to stabilize the ether. And one of the great uh, compounds or chemicals to stabilize ether is alcohol. So every, every jar, bottle, can of ether you buy is going to have some inhibitor in it. An inhibitor is preventing oxidation. But alcohol is a great inhibitor. The reason they don't wanna put alcohol in the standard, they use a concentrated inhibitor in it. The, the reason they don't want to put alcohol in the, in the ether they send to us is because it has so much water, right? It's got 95% water and 5% ethanol. But if you could, once you make your iodizer, once you mix your salts and your, your uh, solvents together and you have the little bottle of iodizer, a big bottle of iodizer, however you make it, your ether stabilized. And that's what I, I encourage people to do. Buy your collodion, buy your salts, and buy your ether. Make You don't make e a collo photographic collodion right away, just make the iodizer and stabilize the ether and then store that in a, in a, a dark or semi-dark and cool or semi-cool place. Boom, you're done. You, you're safe all the way around. Other than when you pour it out and you want to be ventilated and all that, right? When you're pouring plates I, and stuff. I buy from a, a friend uh, the other side of the country. He mix, uh, finished to me, eat uh, alcohol and the salts. I die. Perfect. Finish. Yeah. And I want to make new. I take collodion, mix it together, and I wait for a week. That's up and go. Yep. Yep. And guess what? I first published that, and I ripped it off an old manual and that from 1920 in Kodak. I first published making iodizer and stabilizing. It was really more to stabilize the ether, but people used it so they didn't make up a mixed collodion, salt, or salts, and ether and alcohol together, and then only make two plates, and their collodion went red after six months, and they couldn't use it. So I first published making iodizer, taking Kodak's information from that uh, 1920 book and say, do this for safety, do this for usability. Uh, I've, got, I've got a recipe where you can make as much as little as 17 milliliters of, of photographic collodion. If you want to pour one little tiny plate, just mix up your iodizer and collodion together and pour your plate and off you go. And then you don't, what you don't risk is making a bunch of mixed collodion and you say, oh, I'm going to make these plates. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this up. You make a few plates, and next thing you know, it's three or four or six months later, and you say, God, I haven't made a plate. I'm going to go look at my clothing. It's, it's blood red, right? Because it's oxidized. The iodides are absorbed in, and it's, it's oxidized. And, and it's good for negatives if you go out in the sun to use it. But people want, most people make positives. They want something with enough tonal range to make the image look good, but they don't want to commit to 200 or 500 mils of mixed photographic collodion. And, and that's what the iodizer does: safety and and um, feasibility and usability. Yeah, so it, it's a great method. It's I, I've never seen it published anywhere else other than the old manuals, and I just kind of ripped them off and started encouraging years ago. This was 15 years ago. I started encouraging people to use that as their methodology, and most people do now. Um, not always people go to a shop and just buy straight up, you know, mixed collodion. And if they want to buy 500 mils of mixed collodion, that's a lot of photographic plates. If they use that up in a decent amount of time, fine. You know, that's no problem. I missed the beginning. I asked about yoking the plate. Can I, oh, edge around the plate on positive. Okay, Phil's asking, he, he, he's asking about borax. So we'll keep him in mind. Where do you get borax in Europe? Just the plain, simple borax. It's, it should be readily available there. I just haven't looked. And then he asked about yoking or subbing the plates, right? He's asking, can you sub positive plates? Sure. 
there's two ways. What, what is subbing? Subbing means you take a very weak solution of albumin, meaning egg white and distilled water. Very, I say one large egg white and a liter of distilled water. Mix that up, filter it so it's nice and clean. I, you can dip a Q-tip in it and run it around the edge of the plate and let it dry. Or you can steam the plate and pour albumin just like collodion and then let them dry. You can do the whole plate or you can just do the edge. What's the difference? A lot of people don't like the darker edge. Albumin will give you a little more density in the image. And, um, uh, and then on the other side, people don't want to go to all the fuss of doing the entire plate, of subbing the entire plate. What does albumin do? Albumin is, uh, I believe it's a French word for egg white. And if you were ever a kid like I was, I threw eggs at cars. <laughs> <laughs> the egg white dried on the paint. And when you pull the egg white off, the paint comes off with it, right? So we know that that egg white secures the collodion. So if you're kind of crappy at the, the cleaning the plate or you're working in an environment that's not ideal or you're kind of rough with the plates, all it takes is one little corner and all of a sudden you got a fish gill and the whole collodion uh, layer lifts. So what this does is you, you let you edge the plate let it dry, pour your collodion on it, atta it attaches to that egg white, then you're pretty much good to go. I mean, you can still peel them, but it takes a lot more to, to damage them. So yes, you can do positives. If you're having problems with lifting, if you're using a particular glass material, or maybe you're not using uh, uh, ether, an additional ether in your, uh, in your collodion, it, ether helps with it, adherence. Um, yes, absolutely. Sub your plates or edge your plates, wh whatever you want to call it or do the full plate. I've done negatives, which I really quite like. I've done a whole set of uh, completely albuminized negatives, builds that density up just a little bit. That layer of egg white adds just a little more density to the negative. It, it, it really does make kind of a difference. And I don't have to, I can't worry about lifting and peeling in the field. And sometimes I'll put them in wash tubs and they're slopping around in water for five or six hours. I, I just can't risk a, a field going dr driving three or four hours and making plates and having them lift off because I didn't edge or albuminize the plate for negative. So yes, do it if you're having a problem with that. Sean says, hi, Quinn, on average, how many plates can silver bath take before requiring heavy maintenance? Great question. I filter after every use and keeping a record of how many plates. Yes. First off, take notes. When you're first starting out and you'll get this down, you'll, you'll, you'll take a mental note of it. You won't have to take notes anymore. Your very first silver bath, I don't care what size it is, what size of plates you're making. Let's let's say you're starting out with four by five or five by four, as the British like to say, five by four plates. And you have your little silver bath of uh, 500 milliliters, let's say, half a liter. Brand new, everything's brand new. And you run 10 plates through that. What I recommend, that's that's your first day, five five to 10 plates. Don't Don't really pay attention to the numbers. Think about more the methodology. What I recommend you doing is at the end of the day, you take your funnel and your 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 uh, coffee filter and your pads, funnel that back into your jar. Let it breathe, let it funnel, let it clear out. You're, what you're doing is you'll get those little bits of collodion out that broke off your plates during the session. Uh, you'll get a little bit of aeration, let some of those solvents kind of aerate out. Five, 10 plates isn't a big deal. And you do that every time, like you're saying. Um, you're saying after every use, I'm keeping a record. I filter and I'm keeping a record. Perfect. That you're absolutely on spot with that. So after you do five or 10 sessions, 50, 60, 80 plates like this, something like that, you're probably going to have to take your silver bath. If you smell it, once you start smelling those solvents in your silver bath, put it up your nose, smell it. If you smell ether and alcohol, pour it in your glass cookie jar or put it in something wide mouth so it can aerate, put it out in the sun. Let it sun for a day or two days, whatever you want. You'll pull all that organic material, it'll turn up black down at the bottom, filter that off um, and go back to normal. That's kind of regular maintenance, right? That's kind of regular stuff we do. Every 50, 80, 100 plates, small plates, something like that. So your question is, is when do you have to do heavy maintenance? What is heavy maintenance first off? Heavy maintenance is, is your bath is so filled with iodide, iodides that you actually start precipitating them out onto the plate and it creates little pinholes all over the plate. Um, you also, if you haven't been aerating your bath, you'll get what I call solvent streaks and model marks from the actual solvent. Remember, we're putting 
wet plates, wet with uh, with solvent, right? Alcohol and ether, especially the alcohol, um, but ether as well, down into a silver bath. I mean, it's skinning over, but it's still wet. We put it down on a silver bath. So that's going to off gas into the liquid. So your silver bath needs to aerate. But moreover, over time, you have those two byproducts from double decomposition, right? You have the cadmium and the ammonium or potassium, whatever your whatever salt you're using. You have those nitrate byproducts. You need to account for those. You need to account for the solvents and you need to account for that overabundance of iodides. Because what you're doing is that double decomposition, you're shooting off, you're filling that bath up constantly with iodides. And once those become so full and there's no room for them to kind of hang out, they go right onto the plate, dissolve or precipitate and create a tiny little pinhole. And you'll see pinholes everywhere. You know, glass, you'll hold it up, there'll be holes, there'll be black little holes all over on tin types, that kind of thing. So when does that happen? Well, it depends. I have to I have to say this. I may go over a little bit too complicated, but I have to say this. It depends on the salts in your collodion, how strong, and it depends on the pH of your bath. How much of this double decomposition, how hard you're working that bath. Normally with positive uh, uh, baths, if I had that little 500 mil five by four bath, I probably run two or 300 plates through that before I ever have a pinhole or an iodide problem. So that's what heavy maintenance is addressing. So what is heavy maintenance? Heavy maintenance is taking, uh, and if you've ever done this, this is the beginning of heavy maintenance. Have you ever had a bath that you're, I don't know, 100 mils, say you have a liter bath and you're 100 mils or 150 mils short of bath. It's evaporated, you've dripped it, whatever it is. And you go and pour distilled water in that and it turns all cloudy blue. You ever had that happen? That is, those are the iodides precipitating out of that. If you were to take that distilled water and add a little bit of silver nitrate to it and pour it in your bath, you wouldn't get that precipitate. Now that'll clear up. Of course, it'll absorb back into the bath. But heavy maintenance, what you do is you take a third volume. So if you had 1,000 mils, you take 300 mils of distilled water, pour that in the bath. That pulls all those excess iodides out of there. Then you take a little bit of baking soda in a dropper and whatever, however you want to do it, or ammonia, some hardcore pH 14 base, and you throw it in there and you give it something to attach to. Now, remember, your bath's a little acid and your, your basics in acid. Remember the volcano in high school? <laughs> That's what we're talking about, acids and basics. So do this slowly as you're adding your baking soda or your base, your ammonia, whatever you're doing. Um, that will give that those iodides, something to attach to, and those byproducts, something to attach to, fall to the bottom, turn black. Put it out in the sun, fall to the bottom, and turn black. You decant that material off the top. You check your silver bath level, how much silver you have in it, and check your pH and adjust accordingly. And that's a brand new clean bath. Now, people say, well, why, why are you against boiling or heating up your silver? Why do people heat up or boil their silver? And they did it in the 19th century. You can read about it. You can also read about the explosions and the problems they had with it and the off-gassing of it too. It's a very, the fumes aren't so great for you. Um, <clears throat> why do they do that? Primarily they do that to expedite the aeration of the bath, meaning that they, you heating up a bath, you can really get rid of those solvents fast. You, you, they, just, they just go away really fast. Most of the time people have problems with their silver bath is solvent related, most of the time. So if you can get rid of those solvents, um, you'll, you'll clean your bath up really nice. And it also, once you put a base in there and you heat it up, it also allow, allows the exit. Uh, it, 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 it's like a super scrubber. But here's the problem with, with heating up your bath. If you look up silver fulminate, you'll read the ingredients, what it takes to make silver fulminate. A, a little piece of silver fulminate, you can blow on it or put, put a feather on it and it'll blow up. It's super one of the most combustible materials there are. Look up silver fulminate, look what it takes to make it. It's 80 degrees Celsius heating up a silver bath with alcohol and nitric acid in it. That's basically what it takes. So do people heat up their silver baths? Yes. Do I recommend it? Hell no. I would never talk about safety and addressing issues. No way. I would be on the hook for that. Anybody that's publishing and recommending that, good luck.
because the first time you have a fire or an explosion, um, they might look back and say, hey, where did you get that information to heat up your silver bath? A lot of people do it though. Um, well, I wouldn't say a lot, but there's a few people that recommend it and do it because it is fast. It cleans baths well. They did it in the 19th century. Yes, all of that. And they also didn't wear gloves and they didn't care about ventilation. There's all kinds of stuff. They had wood burning stoves. There's all kinds of things they did, right? It's called progress. So back in the vein of safety and saying, have fun, but don't be too paranoid. This is where I don't cross that line. I do not heat silver baths up. I, I just don't do it. Um, if you do, please get rid of my book before anything happens because I don't want them finding my book in your shop. So no, don't get rid of my book. Just, I, I, I am being a little bit facetious, but a little bit quite serious as well. Uh, is there anything we can clean our plates with other than calcium whiting? Um, yeah, you can clean your plates with anything you want to clean your plates with. People put them in dishwashers and use uh, detergent soaps and all kinds of stuff. The problem with that is you're probably going to have to do an additional cleaning regardless with some type of alcohol before you pour the plate because dish soap, puts, a lot of that dish soap has a, a binder to it and it'll put a layer, you know, you don't get spots and all that stuff. That's a layer of, of stuff, it, it, micro, microscopic, right? But it's still on there. And, and so you can clean with about anything. Why do we use calcium carbonate, alcohol, and distilled water? Calcium carbonate is a like a 10,000 grit sandpaper. They use it in making instruments for the final uh, uh, surface of those. Um, it's, it's a grit. It's a sandpaper to clean off any surface, anything on the, on the surface. It'll grab two in a bind. Why alcohol? Alcohol is one of the best solvents you can get, right? Alcohol is a great solvent. It'll melt things away. It'll clean stuff up. So you have your sandpaper, your, your solvent, and then the water, the distilled water, PPM zero, pH seven, perfect balance to carry those two products in, and off you go. You've got this perfect cleaner. You can use rotten stone too. Rotten stone is a gray kind of carbonate based, kind of gray grit kind of cleaner. I like calcium carbonate. It's easy to get. It's easy to use. Um, that's all I use, uh, you know, and once you get that stuff down, you get those plates squeaky clean. I never have plates peel, knock on wood, <laughs> but it's a great cleaner. I just, this idea of putting them in your dishwasher, soaking them in nitric acid and all kinds of stuff like that. There's all kinds of methodologies out there. I just find it's another step you're going to have to take to get your plates right after doing that. Usually usually you're going to have another step. And I don't want more steps in this. I want fewer steps, higher quality, fewer steps, less equipment. People always come to me and say, hey, I got a great idea. And the first question I always ask them is in workflow methodology, right? Uh, the first question I ask them, before you tell me what that is, does it involve more compounds, more equipment, or more stuff I have to get? Well, yeah, a couple of clamps and some of this cleaner and this product. No, no, if you're taking things away and still keeping the, the product high, I'm I'm all ears, right? I'll listen to you. But if you're talking about adding more stuff, no. It's already daunting enough, people coming into the process. They come into my studio and see my stuff and they're like, oh my God, do I really want to do this? Because it is, it, you know, I mean, I experiment a lot and stuff too. But really the bottom line is you can keep this as simple and as basic as you, you it's unbelievable how simple you can keep this and still do really high quality images. Uh, we tend to complicate things because uh, sometimes we get bored, sometimes we're trying stuff out, sometimes we be, we're lazy, whatever it is. <clears throat> egg whites, let's see, with edging the plate with egg whites, can I store the plates ready for, yes, great question. So he's cleaned his plate with calcium carbonate, squeaky clean, both sides, edges. Be sure to take that calcium carbonate off the edges of that plate, remember? You're putting it down in your bath. You'll you'll drive your pH way up real quick. Putting putting calcium carbonate in your silver bath, your pH will go up over ten or twelve, right? A couple of plates. So clean your edges as well as your surfaces. Take your Q-tip or full immersion, whatever you want to do. Edge your plate, albuminize your plate, let it dry, store them for years. They're ready to get. You can indefinitely. There's no problem. How about lens cleaner, glass cleaner that uses vinegar? You can try that. Um, what I found is, uh, again, these products always have something additional to them. The calcium carbonate cleaner is a minimal product. We know what's in it. We know it, it doesn't off gas. It doesn't come. It doesn't stick on the plate. Um, so you can try things. I, all I can say is try the cleaner. See if you don't kill your silver bath and you and you don't have plates peeling. 
and you don't have marks on them, you don't, all kinds, you know, the tests on what a clean plate looks like, try them and see. That's all I can say. I wouldn't get too crazy, but <clears throat> yeah, lens cleaner has pri pr uh -huh, polymers. Yeah. Yeah. Deionized water and polymers. Try it and see. Yeah. Lens cleaners, again, sometimes the polymer, we, you know, we think of it, you know, as kind of the, the physical substance, but so, you know, you clean your glasses or your lenses uh, may have a little coat or something on there, right? So yeah, just try it and see. Yeah, you, that's a good, good uh, question. Good questions about that, because these are the things people send me email about, and they show me a plate and say, "What happened?" It's like, "Oh God, I wasn't there. I don't know how you cleaned your plates. I don't know where you got your chemistry. I don't know your environment." I mean, there's a billion questions. Some of the typical stuff, right? So drying out, drying the plates down. Um, developer suites, developer islands, um, all those kind of standard things that are usually technique driven, not chemistry problems. There's there's problems with chemistry and problems with techniques, and you got to separate those two. So you have to isolate and say, is this a technique problem? Are you physically doing something wrong with the plate, or is it a chemical problem? Do you have something wrong with your chemistry? And and the chemical problems can get very very complicated really quick. Because you're not there. Who makes your chemistry? What's the CAS, CAS number on your salts? What you know? Somebody wrote me the other day. Uh, I don't think it was Sean or Phil, but I think he was in the UK. But somebody wrote me the other day and says, "Why is it my uh, quick clear working? Why is it still clear? Why is it light green?" And and you know, I what what's your iodide, right? It, if you step back and you start learning how the process works. If you step back from it, you'll quickly realize that if you know a little bit about chemistry and what's happening when you put these chemicals together and form that compound, you'll quickly realize how to resolve problems. So if your iodide isn't, if you're using KI, if you're using potassium that's not solvent uh, uh, soluble in the solvents, if you're using NH4I or ammonium iodide and your, your solution isn't turning, changing colors, and what does that color mean to your silver bath? Those are all the things that I try to expand and talk about in my book. Um, I, I, I will show you this, um, just to reiterate on the question that I had the other day about, uh, I wanna show you guys this again. I know a lot of you have seen this, but uh, this is uh, page 53 in my book. This is probably the greatest thing that I can, when people are having problems, about this is a visual representation about what color your your iodized collodion is versus what color your or, or what kind of bath you're using, and there's a lot of problems that um, can you can have resolved just by matching those up: the pH and the silver content in your bath, and the color or the iodized the the, the level of i uh, how how iodized your collodion is. Right. If you marry those two things and you study that, you'll quickly realize that the minute you see a, a plate with problems, you can say, hey, wait a minute. I just used the rest of that collodion, my silver bath same. I made fresh collodion and now my plates are doing this. You can start matching that up and seeing that. And that's kind of a problem that I had the other day. Phil says, can we talk about veiling or overexposing with the developer? Yes. Wiping it away does not does not work well. But I found if you have very careful and only wipe away the blacks. Let that's I thank you for bringing that up because here's I want to address that veiling or scumming versus fogging. Let's talk about those two things. What is veiling and scumming? So, the, the vernacular, the words we use in this sometimes you know it's kind of like language, we it is language, but it's kind of like uh, you're talking, you're using these words to describe this, and I'm using different words to describe the same thing. And we think we're butting heads, but we're really not. And so we need the same vernacular. So what I've tried to do is say veiling and scumming. This is the definition of veiling and or scumming. You can hear both terms. I like veiling because that's more appropriate. Veiling is when you have a plate that you, you have developed, developed the unexposed silver on it meaning that your blacks are covered in a veil of silver that you've developed, you've developed, you've reduced the silver, which you shouldn't have. So that means two things. Number one, you can wipe it off with a cotton ball and you see your image underneath. So, so the problem will be heat and or lack of restrainer in your developer. 
So let's address the first one. Heat exacerbates everything in, in chemistry. Organic chemistry is what we're talking about here. Heat exacerbates everything. So it's hot out. Uh, John was talking about, I'm going to be working in these temperatures. What do I do? It's hot out and you have a restrainer in your developer that worked fine at home in your studio. You go outside, you pour that on 15 seconds and oh my God, your whole, all your blacks are soft. All your blacks have a layer of sil developed silver over them. You take a cotton ball under water and you run that. Oh, wow. There it is. There's the contrast. So that tells you, you know, you got to remember the entire plate is covered with silver. It's all subject to reducing all of it, right? We put the restrainer in the developer to hold that back, to bring up your highlights and your midtones down to your void areas. We don't want the silver on your void areas or your black areas to develop. That's what the restrainer does. How much restrainer do you need depends on what environment you're working in and what kind of, how much iron you have in your developer, what kind of variant you're using, making positives or negatives. So <clears throat> most of the time what people do um, when they have veiling is one of two things. They're working in a hot environment with not enough acid in their developer. If they just put a little more acid in their developer, 10% or so to start, the veiling will usually go, go away. The second scenario is more technique driven. That's a chemical problem. The second one is more technique driven. What they do is they underexpose. They didn't have enough exposure on the plate. They bring it in the dark room and they push that development. Oh, another, oh, there it's coming. It's coming. It's 20 seconds, 25 seconds. Well, what are you doing? You're developing that entire image out and you're going to have bailing over it because your exposure was not enough on the plate originally. So you tried to push it. And that's where you get, that's a technique problem. So if you increase your exposure, come back in, pour it, boom, 15 seconds, there's your highlights, midtones, and your void areas without veiling. So those are kind of the two scenarios that people will run into. One's chemical-based, meaning an environment is hot or your developer's old or, you know, there's a lot of things. There's just not enough restrainer to hold back. Once you put more, uh, more restrainer in to compensate for that, clean images. The second one is technique driven, not enough exposure, pushing that, pushing that, and then you have to wipe it off. And it's still weak. It's still a weak image. Um, that's why we use the 15 second development time as a baseline. Adjust your exposure based on never say, oh, I'll just give it 20 more seconds or all oh, in development. Oh, I'll just give it another 10 seconds. No, because what you're doing is you're now beginning to develop that unexposed silver the black areas, the void areas in your in your image. So that that's kind of the rule of that. Um, now let's talk about fogging. Fogging is the other word. There's veiling and fogging, or veiling and scumming and fogging. Veiling and scumming is technique, underexposure, pushing development, or chemical, not enough restrainer, holding back in development, right, depending on your environment. Fogging, what is fogging? Pour a plate, it, uh, develop it, and it's got it's it's just clouded over. It's got a streak in it, or it's got it's got something. And you take it. Uh, the first thing I ask is, does it wipe off? No, it doesn't wipe off. The void areas, the black areas, the shadow areas are covered in silver, developed out. What can that be? That can be one of two things. Again, one is equipment or technique, and the other one is chemical. The first one can be a light leak. That's usually. Um, it's about 50-50 on these. Usually a light leak in the bellows of the camera, the wrong type of light you're, you're developing under, or some lens flare. You're using an old Petzval. You don't have a hood on it, and you're facing a certain way of light. You know, there's all kinds of light bouncing around in there. You can, you can get flares and streaks, and sometimes you just get a complete uh, fog over the plate, right? You're exposing that plate to UV light without a controlled environment. So Check your, your bellows for pinholes, get under dark, cover your lens up, make sure, let your eyes adjust, put it in nice bright light, make sure you don't have any pinholes. Check the type of red light you're using in your dark, your dark room. I recommend people are able to read a book, or, or specifically I say read my book. <laughs> read a book in the dark room, enough light to be able to read in, right? So you want it bright enough, but there's r different kinds of red light and some of them aren't appropriate. I don't recommend yellow. Yes, some yellow lights work, but they have, they're they even more problematic. Um, uh, people say, oh, I put ruby lift on my windows, and they have great big windows. Ruby lift fails at a certain level. Um, you, you, you'll fog the plate. So enough light, red light to read, the right kind of red light, and check your bellows, check your lens, 
Check your dark room or dark tent or dark box itself for light leaks as well, too. It takes quite a bit. Uh, you know, we're working in, in this process, very slow, very, you know, ISO 1, ISO 2, or even less. So it takes a lot of light. But if you're making 15, 20, uh, 15, 20 second exposures out in the bright light or studio lights, or you have bright lights in your dark room, you're going to you're going to get some fogging possibly if you have leaks. So it'll put up with a lot, but it won't put up with with that much. The second type of fogging deals with your silver bath. And it goes back to page 53 in my book talking about the pH of your bath. A lot of times and it's really pH of the power of hydrogen a lot it's it's difficult to explain in a couple of minutes. But let's just say your pH is important for that double decomposition process to take place where we exchange the ions. So where we turn the, the salts into halogens to make it photographic, uh, light sensitive. Um, that process, just I always say like growing plants, you need a certain pH for the nutrients, to, for the plants to uptake the nutrients to create photosynthesis. This is a lot the same, similar, or very good example in that double decomposition process. The pH is important. If your pH is off, if it really, if it's too basic, um, you're going to have a problem with what's called fogging. It looks like fogging, it won't wipe off. Usually I say start with 10 drops of nitric acid and drop your pH. Positive, you can go down to pH two and a half, pH three. I like pH four as kind of a balance for positives, and you can go as uh, up to pH five with negatives. What does the pH difference mean? I've talked about this a little before. It's the amount of silver it's uptaking. So if you think about it, just on the surface, say, "Oh, I'm making positive, and my pH is over five. I'm packing a lot of silver, and you're using a lot of silver out of your bath too, right? I'm packing a lot of silver on that plate that I don't need, and I'm developing it, and I've got, you know, I've got this this fogging over it. So Acidic baths for positives, more neutral baths or closer to neutral baths for negatives. You want to pack the silver on on negatives. You want a very light uh, uptake on positives. So that's kind of veiling and scumming and fogging. So when people talk about fogging, we're talking about light issues or pH balance bath issues. When you talk about veiling or scumming, we're talking about restrainer and the developer not enough. Uh, developing the unexposed silver and or pushing it too long with the develop any developer if you push too long my negatives I've talked about the developer I I use two percent iron in a lead you know a liter is what I'm talking about two percent iron and up to nine percent acid that's so I, I get a minute minute and a half two minutes of developer uh, uh, to going on my negative so I hope that makes sense I don't know I hope I'm not talking out of school here too much I, I worry about people saying, my God, you're putting me to sleep, dude. What is your problem? You are geeking out hard. <laughs> I love it. I love the chemistry of it. It's art and alchemy. It's, 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 it's mysterious. It's fun. It's, it's fun to learn about. And what better way to uh, have your journey kind of uh, come full circle with saying, hey, I figured that out. Hey, that's what I, you know, and just feeling good about making images. Can we talk about yellowing of albumin? Yes, Karine, yes. Um, um, yes, yes, yellow and fade, yes, exactly. If you do, um, God, I just saw a paper on this the other day off of Academia. Um, if you do research on albumin prints, they have the highest failure rate in all the historic uh, pot prints. And the reason is, is it's very, very difficult to get those washed properly. And then it takes very little uh, UV exposure to yellow them up. Um, oh my God, do I have, I do. Can I show you one? I'm going to show you one. And this is in my lifetime. This is uh, 15 years old. Let me show you one. Cause I'm packing up and I just happened to run into this. And I've got, I hate to leave the camera, but I have to show you because it's such a great example of yellowing. I hope I have it here. Do I? I'm all over the place. I'm all over the place. Yeah, I do. So I made this. I don't have a year on it. I'm thinking this was, uh, God, this must have been 2006. 2006. This is now Beeman print. And you've probably seen the original. I Oh. Yeah, 
I made it for the, this is one of the Archer ones. Look at that. So one of the reasons I got away from albumin printing, and don't get me wrong, I love albumin printing. I do. I think that it's it's gorgeous. Uh, yeah, it was for the I put it in the Archer show there. Um, part of that Archer show. Uh, don't get me wrong, because I I do. I love albumin printing, but I got away from it, and I don't do it anymore simply for the fact of my death denial. <laughs> my immortality project, right? I, I want my prints to live on. And what got me started on aristotypes or collodio chloride and gelatin chloride, uh, collodio chloride's incredibly, incredibly archival. Um, God, where was that one? I just saw it in my book. Here's that same one that, John, remember this? I haven't even fixed it or washed it. That was weeks ago incredibly, incredibly archival, right? So what got me going down the path of saying, our, I, I got on a trip about archivability. Immediately, albumin prints went out the door. The next went out the door were salt prints. And what came on board were gel aristotypes, gelatin and collodion aristotypes. The archivability is outstanding. And if you want a great sharp image, that's what it is. Then guess what the next path was a few years ago? years ago, I go into pigment prints. Well, you take the silver completely out of the question, and now you've got prints that are thousands of years, not that we're going to last even 50 years, but thousands of years that will stand up to time. It's just ink and paper, right? If your paper is acid-free and your inks, lithographic inks, good quality, it, they'll never go away. And not only it's, I just didn't switch over to that, I just, within my lifetime, I just started seeing some of my prints yellow, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe it's my, my issue. But if I go back and I start thinking about it, it's like, I am kind of conservative. I don't want to run thousands of gallons of water. We live in the Western United States where we've gone through droughts and I'm, I'm conscious of that. And I just don't, I have problems environmentally with some of the stuff that we do. And I just didn't want to run faucets 24 seven to wash these things properly. So the aesthetics are beautiful. I love the, the salt, albumin and salt, but there's some difficulty environmentally and archival, I'll say ar archivability and environmentally, I got away from them. Um, I still teach them, I can still do them, all that stuff. And they're great if you want something, you know, semi-permanent. I mean, look, I sold a lot of work in galleries and shows. Uh, people own my work all over the world. And I just don't, I don't like to, I don't like that risk. And if you're doing something historical, if you're doing something for an institution or a uni or something like that, they, they expect your quality to be, you know, archival quality. That's what they expect, right? So I got away from that a lot. Again, I still teach it. I still like it. I still all that, but I won't use it for my own work. I won't sell work. That, that I've made with it now. And this was a few years ago um, that I realized that what was happening with my albumin prints, not so much, not as much with my salt prints because I waxed them quite often. And I, I noticed wax really ups the, the quality and the archivability of them. I, I even started waxing out my albumin prints that I'd already made. I, that's how kind of nervous I got about it. And it worked great. Um, but yes, the yowing is, it takes a tremendous, tremendous, amount of washing the right paper, a tremendous amount of washing and the right processing the technique using to make them. Because honestly, your albumin prints are gonna change within a handful of years. And if they start changing within about five years, and if you put them in any kind of environment with UV light, it, it'll change in weeks. You'll know, you'll know. And I did this test. I went through my methodology I put my uh, print out in the UV and it lasted two weeks and it looked worse than that. So, you know, maybe it's me, right? Maybe it's, but, but, but again, it was my tech, my methodology of how much water I wanted to use, how much time I wanted to spend on them. And, and honestly, at the end of the day, I just didn't feel good about the water consumption. So off we go with the aristotypes, very low maintenance, very high quality. You can look at an 1860 aristotype today. It'll look like it was printed yesterday. You can look at any pigment print, carbon or oil, they haven't changed thousands of years, right? There's no silver. What we're talking about is the binding of the silver chloride and the fix 
and not washing that unexposed, again, unexposed silver out, exposing it to UV light and changing colors and eventually going black. And that's that's the problem with, with all of these. That's why you won't see um, all those old boys, uh, uh, William Henry Jackson, Watkins, all those old boys, albumin prints are stuffed away, closed up, dark, cool, humidity controlled. You will, they will not see the light of day unless you have some special authority to get in to see them very rarely. Because of that, they're very sensitive to that light. And nobody was there to see how they processed them. And we've lost a lot. I mean, look, we're losing, we're even losing C prints, right? C prints from the 1970s now, right? So we don't know what 20, 30 years down the road, these modern prints, especially, you know, inkjet prints, you know, oh, this is a K8 ink in the last 500 years. Really? <laughs> How do you know in the last 500 years, you know? So I, going back to my death denial and my death anxiety and my terror management theory, I want my, if I'm going to put all this work in, and, and really I'm, I'm being a little facetious there, but I, if I'm going to sell work, I want work that will last, that people put it on their walls, put, people put it in their collections, I want it to last. And that's, I've, I've had to select a process not only based on the aesthetics and the, the material that supports it, I've talked about that a lot, but also on the longevity of it, right? People don't want to pay money for a print and have it five years later. Oh my God, look at that. Oh my God, I, I just I just bought this, you know, a few years ago. Look at it, you know? I, I You know, and eventually that thing will go. Yes, sir. Yes, what about the use uh Acrylic uh, uh, Liquitex. Yes, acrylic, we have uh, mm -hmm. over over the albumin. Because, exactly. Uh, this firm, let's say it's uh, it's help against uh, UV. Yes, it does. You're right, Jan. Well, we talked a lot. You, if you look in my book, you'll read about Liquitex. Yeah. Yeah. I protect my uh, with this after. Yeah, exactly. Um, here, here's the test to see in 20 years what you're talking about. <laughs> there you go. I was just going to address that, Jan. We're right back to where we started with. Liquitex is a great product. Now, if people don't want to mess around with varnish, uh, gum sand rack, and the changing colors, and they don't want to, they don't want to sift out, you know, uh, shellac or whatever the color shifts are in, in the varnish, or they don't want to mess with fire or flames or heat or toaster ovens, less equipment. Liquitex, right? I recommend Liquitex. The problem with Liquitex is we don't have the history on it. We don't have 170 years of gum sandrack varnish on a plate. We know that. I have them, or I had them sitting over on my shelf. I could show you. We know that that's solid. We don't know with Liquitex. We're right back with the K3 inks or the K4 inks. We're right back with modern claims about products. We're talking about decades or even centuries of standing up to things. Now, I, I really do believe it's probably a lot better to, to, to treat your, your paper prints, especially albumin or salt, with something a little more. I recommend wax. I recommend beeswax and lavender oil. That's, that's going to be as good, you know, well, I don't know what chemical. Liquitex does make a claim, and they do use it on paintings and things, right? They do use Liquitex. That's what it's made for. Gloss, high gloss, matte. You can get all kinds of finishes in it. Um, so there's probably, in our lifetime, you're probably going to be okay, right? And I'm splitting hairs. This is, this is, I'm, we're talking, you know, we're talking about people even care about this stuff. <laughs> about my, I'm talking about my own mental instability about caring about my photographs. Nobody's going to care. I mean, I, I get that. But I do. I care. And, and I feel an obligation to make sure that I'm doing my due diligence on archivability as, as well as aesthetics and everything else we talked about. But that's a good point, Jan. Liquitex, I talk about it. Absolutely. You can probably watch some videos that I've talked about it as well, too. Um, when, uh, yes, sir. You said UV light, but uh, for some reason, I have some albumin prints, which I have uh, taken in uh, closed boxes. And within a year or less, they became like the one you showed me. They yes. didn't see any light. Yeah, Would exactly. that because of poor washing? A, a poor washing and as well as the strength and compound. It's as well as your methodology and technique of how strong, is it a 10% or 15% fix you're, you're mixing with that? What's your hmm. silver content on the paper, right? 
and how much did you did you use a did you use a, a, a an alkaline to help pull that? Did you did you how long did you wash? Was it was it continuous? How many gallons a minute, liters a minute did you wash? Was it was it an archival print washer with with distilled water? Was it bound up with minerals in the water? I mean, there's. Mm. I mean, technically, you can get way down a rabbit hole. What we do know is that albumin, especially, but salt kind of categories with that just a little bit. Albumin, even gold toned, um, has a very, you know, uh, in in the big picture, you're talking a very short lifespan for photographs. I mean, it's just that way. But that's a good thing. I mean, that's a good question. A good, good, good uh, conversation. Uh, Drew asked exposure. What's that? Albumin is out. <laughs> I came to the same conclusion a few years yeah. ago myself. I, I mean, and I love albumin. I do. I love albumin. And they're beautiful when they're first made. Yes. The, the, the clarity, the resilience, and all of that. Absolutely. They're, they're, they are. And I, I don't mean to downplay any of it. And there'll be people that probably will chime in and say, wait a minute, you're talking shite. You know, you're, I have albumin prints that are this, you know, and and ask them about how much water they use and ask them about how much time. I wanted a process, like I said, that supported me aesthetically, but would last a lot longer than what I was seeing in my own work. And it's probably just me, but but I see it with other people as mm -hmm. well, too. We're, we're not alone. <laughs> yeah. I have about 10% um, uh, of my prints which have survived, and I still couldn't figure out why they survived. Usually my washing is almost the same, my fixer content is the same, my technique is the same, but for some reason, some of them really survived. Uh, we'll see. And, and, and if you could have a time machine and go back and look at you making all those, you'd pick out little tiny things, a different type Thank of you. paper. The paper was manufactured different by the producer at one time over the year, or that was a little what stronger. The chicken ate. What's that? What kind of food the chicken ate? Yeah, exactly. food of the chicken, yeah, that. <laughs> no, seriously, I, yeah. absolutely. I mean, we can break that down to so many variables of why this happened to some and not others, but mostly what we're talking about, most will not survive. And when I say survive, I'm talking, you know, 100 years, 150 years, 200 years, whatever that kind mm -hmm. of archivability quotation you put on that. We're talking about, even even the best in the best in the world from the 19th century, those prints will still suffer from what we're talking about. They just will. So it's the process, it's the fallibility, it's the weak point in the process you choose, the printing process. Uh, and, and we can't control all the manufacturers and what the chickens eat and how they make the paper and what temperature it was that day and what fix they made on that batch. We we can't control all that. So we're we're at the mercy of the products we bring in and we're at the mercy of our own fallibility on our technique and how we stay consistent or not. And I've been pretty serious about some projects, but I can't say I've been so serious that I'm like, you know, I mean, I, I'm thorough, but I'm not, I'm fallible. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a human being. So Drew wants to ask about, uh, I'm learning to make clothing negatives without experience. So making tin types or ambro types. Yes. Excellent. So I don't have a baseline exposure to work with. In your book, you agree that Archer and Negative is one third more. Yep. Develop films of pyro by inspection, but I'm having difficult seeing the cloning image come out to determine where there's a suck. Okay. Great question, Drew. I appreciate that. Um, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, and then you just address this issue. So let me step back in case. So Drew, um, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Um, and those are great questions. These are questions that people really always, you know, even if you know about it, sometimes you can pick up a little hint after hearing it over and over again, you pick up little things. But so the baseline here again is he's asking about exposure. And the, what we're talking about is we're using the baseline exposure or development time for positives as 15 seconds. So when we move into negatives, we increase that restrainer to eight to nine percent, like 80, 90 milliliters in a liter, and we reduce the iron to about 18 or 20, uh, eight, 1.8 to 2 percent iron versus 3.8 or 4 percent in positives. So, <clears throat> what we're doing, I've said this before, when we're making a positive, we're using, or if it's on gla black glass or metal or whatever, 
we're making a very, very thin negative, right? There's no real positives in photography, unless you talk about, you know, Kodachrome or, you know, Chromes, that kind of thing. But in this case, we're talking the two variants, positive and negative. We're really talking about making a very thin negative on a material that's either black or can be put on black. And we're using reflected light to, to see the size of that grain structure, how bright or how dim it is. And so a thin negative, a positive in this case, against something black with reflected light will appear as a positive. We don't need that much silver. We don't need that much development. We're going for the, the everything in the image will be visible if it's, the exposure's right and the development's right. With a negative, we're using a piece of glass. We're going through the glass to print on paper, especially pot or printing out paper, self-masking paper. So we need the density way, way high. So a good negative looks terrible against black. It looks like dog crap against black, right? That means you, you're overexposing it. A good positive will never print on pot paper. It will just, it'll be a big, flat, muddy mess. It just won't print. Bright ambrotypes I talk about in my book will print on um, a modern developing out paper, you know, a Kodak or Ilford sometimes. And I've had real good luck with oil prints with bright ambrotypes on glass as well. But traditionally, if we're talking about a really, truly well-exposed positive tintype, ambrotype, whatever we're making, it's so thin that it would never technically be able to print. So <clears throat> the point is we don't need that much silver. We don't need that much development. And so we, we adjust our chemistry and our technique accordingly. Chemistry is way strong, right? 44%, up to 4% in the iron. Um, the acid is, is down around 4% or so, 3 4%. So we really, want it to, we really want to reduce everything that's on there quickly in 15 seconds. So you pour your developer on, and depending on the temperature, two to three seconds, four seconds maybe, you'll see your hot, your brightest spot appear, the most brilliant part of the image appear. Five, six, seven seconds, you'll see the midtone starting to appear. Nine, 10, 11 seconds, you'll start seeing the shadows appear. And that's when you take your water, you turn your faucet on or whatever, and you start washing that iron off the plate. It's still developing for another 10 seconds or so, depending on how long you take getting it off till it's not greasy anymore. And now you've got your highlights, your midtones, and your void areas. With a negative, I go up to two minutes. Restrainer's really high. The, the, the acid's really high. The iron's really weak. I pour it on, and I just keep going. Why is that? Because I can look on my ghost dance. They're packed now, but I can look on my ghost dance negatives, and I can hold them up to the light and peer through them. I say, oh, I see that weed. I see that, that structure on the ground or whatever. And then I print it. And there's a ton more material there that I can't even see with my eye. And what I'm getting from that, and that's why albumin prints and any of these prints, if you do them correctly, show you an immense amount of detail, just, just extraordinary, way beyond positives, way beyond ambrotypes or tintypes. So developing on negatives will go, I would say, 30 seconds to two minutes. But you have to adjust your chemistry and your technique accordingly. So, <clears throat> um, so does that answer the question? I hope. I, I, is there anything else? Okay, good. Um, I have to ten-year-old collodion that still works fine. <laughs> uh, Brent, will, will they will they chemicals be fine sitting for that long? Um, let's see. Let me catch up on the uh, oh plain collodion. So Cedric is talking about in the chat. He's talking about plain USP collodion. Uh, hopefully that hasn't been, or even if it's been open, maybe, um, uh, that's fine to use for photographic chemicals. So unmixed, right? Just collodion sitting on the shelf. I've used collodion five years past its expiration date, and its expiration date is three years. So I've used collodion up to eight years and made photographic collodion, and there's no problem. That's plain USP collodion, right? Not mixed, no salts and no solvents. Um, uh, even developer works after a long time. You just need to find your own repairs. Yes, you're right, uh, Cedric. I've used um, I've used developer that's over a year old. It's it's blood red, right? It's all oxidized, all the iron, and it probably probably didn't produce as good as image as I did if I made fresh. But sometimes, you know, that's the way it was. Um, good. They're just having a little chat in there on their own. That's fine. Um, so yeah, you can have. Um, 
both the, the, the chemical issues and the technique issues sneak up on you. I always say isolate these right off the bat, whatever you're doing. Um, I, I say run a chemical plate. And what I mean by that is take a piece of clear glass, whatever size you want, pour your collodion on it, sensitize it in your silver bath for a couple of minutes, whatever, two or three minutes, whatever you do, um, until you don't have those rivulets on there. Don't expose it. Go right to your developer, pour your developer on, go 15 seconds, wash, arrest your development, put it under water, and fix it. And when you pull that plate out of the fix, you should have a clear glass plate. And that's the first thing you can tell if your chemistry is good. If you do a chemical plate or a test chemical test plate and all your chemi chemistry is in order, then you know it's your technique. It's your exposure, it's your light leaks out, your exposure's off, your technique's bad, whatever it is, right? Because you can have, you can develop a clear plate or a test plate and you won't see any sweeps or anything on it. You'll only see sweeps when you have a contrast of light and dark. So, <clears throat> so it's really important you isolate the chemical problems from the technique problems. It's really critical to do that. And, and that way, and then you can address, if you come to me or someone else that's knowledgeable in it, and you can say, hey, look, uh, these are my tests. This is my test plate. My chemistry seems to be fine. And this is my technique plate that I actually tried to make a, an exposure of this scene. And this is what it looks like. Because that will get so much further down the line in troubleshooting. It's difficult to troubleshoot. I get email every single day. And it's difficult to troubleshoot unless you have some baseline to work from. Because like I said earlier, man, I wasn't there when you mixed or made your chemicals or bought your chemistry. I wasn't there for your exposure. I don't know what kind of darkroom you have. I don't know where you learned this or if you have or, you know, there's so many questions and you start asking those questions. You can spend hours, hours trying to troubleshoot with people. And I have over days, uh, if it's something I know and it's looking like this, I'll start them down a path come back the next day, well, I did this and now this. Take that path, make that turn, make that turn, and pretty much we get to a point where we say, okay, this is what it was, this is why it happened, make notes on that, take notes. That's what my book is, is just a bunch of notes. Tried to, I try to put it together and, and, and make some sense of it, just a bunch of notes. And there's always something you can add, right? There's always something you can go back and say, oh, I, I, I wish I could have added that. Guys, it's 1136 in beautiful Denver. Um, I am going to call it good for a Saturday. I'm making um, barbecue ribs in the Instant Pot today. So I'm going to go up and uh, take a stab at that and see how I can do. <laughs> I appreciate everybody joining in. Hopefully you can come back next Saturday. And, uh, can I check ask you a question, uh, Grant? Yes. If I if I take uh, uh, a flowing the plate with the collodion, yes, collodion, and if I go into fast to the silver bar, can that making uh, banding lines and bubbles? But that can do two things. Um, Jan presented a question. I'll, I'll answer this, um, um, and then we'll take off. Jan sent me a plate the other day. He had uh, these. Uh, it looked like a sweep, but it had mm -hmm. bubbles behind it. Um, uh, my old book cover has the same thing with the bottles on it. What happens is your immersion technique into your silver bath needs to, I talk about one smooth, good, quick, not plunge it in and splash silver bath everywhere, but one good solid plunge into the silver. Because if you stop or hesitate, you'll get hesitation lines on the plate. It'll, it'll actually do that double replacement immediately when it starts going in. But you can also sometimes... You can submerge it, and then when you pull it back out immediately, you'll form little bubbles and lines on the surface of it. And so what uh, Jan was talking about was his technique. It's a technique problem. It's not a chemical problem. It's a technique problem of going into your silver bath. And then I say, wait one minute. And you can pull it up and look for rivulets and see how, how far along the process you are, and then push it back down in. But if you put it in, and pull it out immediately, you'll start getting these kind of bubble surface. And it's it's air. It's 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 actually bubbles that are putting different densities of uh, decomposed have that double decomposition process, those little tiny air bubbles. And the, the line will show as well. Yeah. So using that technique, um, one good immersion, wait for one minute, pull it up, look for your rivulets, push it down in. Second minute, 
if you want, pull it a minute and a half, two minutes, pull it up. If you're clear and it's sheeting off, then you're sensitized. We use the three minute rule loosely. That would be a loose general. If you're completely unsure, let it sensitize for three minutes. You're not gonna, you're not gonna have any problems at three minutes. So does that make sense, Jan? Yes, but I also ask about if I, uh, after I've lowered the play, I'm too fast. Yes, I, too fast. Yeah. Uh, because, people, uh, yeah. Because this uh, collodion is a little wet and you go in down to the silver, then yeah. also you got maybe sweeps. Th thank you. you. That's the second part I was going to address. Not only when you pour the collodion, and if you don't check for it skinned over and you put a super wet plate into your collodion, you're going to raise the solvents in your bath like crazy. You're going to have a poor surface on your, on your emulsion or your film, whatever you want to call it, on your collodion. And you're going to raise the solvent level in your bath, like through the roof. You're putting a super wet plate in there, right? You don't want that. You're going to move the plate. You're going to adjust it. So sometimes, rarely, but sometimes people get so anxious about, oh, I got to put it in fast, that they pour it, they wick it off, they push it down in real fast, and you create these problems, not only on the surface of the plate, but also in the um, solvents in your bath. Your bath starts smelling like solvents like immediately like you know within a few plates you're like whoa i can smell my silver bath that shouldn't be pour your plate let it skin over and again this is environment temperature humidity all those things let it skin over put push your finger in the corner and see if it leaves a little finger mark if it does an impression then you're skinned over that's what we call like like pudding right like 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 pudding will skin over it's liquid it skins over that's kind of what you want on the collodion and then push it down in your bath because those solvents and silver are going to go through that skinned um, collodion. If you put it in too wet and too fast, you raise your, your solvent level and you have a, a poorer surface. It won't be a terrible, it'll just be a poorer surface like marks and bubbles and all those kinds of things. Yeah. I've got some really weird, I used to do these portraits. Yeah. I did portraits mainly for all those years. And sometimes I'd get really excited about a portrait I'm doing I pour that, you know, throw it down in the bath, expose the image, come back and develop, and there's a big bubble line right across the eyes, right? I mean, right? It's just like the most un undesirable area, like Murphy's Law, right? So out of all the places you could be, right? <laughs> if I just turned the plate. <laughs> but, yeah, technique is huge. Technique is the biggest thing ever. I mean, you can get your chemistry straight and go for a long time. But technique is always creeping there, so so be attention, pay attention to that. Those are good questions. There's, those are great. Thank you, guys. My move is going great. I appreciate you guys asking about that. Um, we're in phase. Uh, I get my first container in a week. I'll park it out here, eight by eight by sixteen. We'll start packing all these boxes up. My darkroom door, my sinks. Um, I was going to mention, and this is something here at the close I'll let you guys think about. I may end up selling my brand new 20 by 20 Chamonix. I've got a big DeRosier lens on it and I got a rice tripod with it. I've got a 1620 silver bath tank, this 2020 back with a whole plate insert to test plates with. I'm not sure I'm going to do ultra large format on the mountain. I may just stay with whole plate. If you have anybody, if anybody's looking or you hear, um, I would like to sell it. I'm still a little, you know, I'm still a little gassy about it, right? Gear acquisition syndrome. <laughs> I love the camera. I love it. It's got a beautiful rice tripod with it. It's got a big, beautiful, passful uh, DeRoji lens. Um, I just, I have so much stuff. And I also have, for the daguerreotypists out there, I should mention this too, I have a fume hood. A, a mercury pot from Beak House, a beautiful 8x10 mercury pot with half plate, whole plate, 8x10. I have an iodine box and a bromine box, all original stuff uh, or all handmade high quality stuff that I would love to get rid of the daguerreotype stuff. I know I'm not going to do daguerreotypes up there. And then that leaves me with two 10x10 cameras, and that's what I plan to use in the studio. I decided that uh, my next project, whatever that will be, it's probably gonna be a portrait project. I think I mentioned that before. I'm gonna do on whole plate and do oil prints, whole plate, full plate oil prints. So I don't think I'm gonna use that big camera anymore. And uh, so if there's anybody out there looking, get a hold of me, uh, we can talk. Um, don't sell. <laughs> 
I know. I, I I know. I go back and yesterday I was like, I'm not going to sell that. And then I come down here. And, oh my God. I got it. I can't pack all this stuff up here. You know, my camera gear is like takes up half a room, you know? So, but if here's my position right now, I don't have plans for it. It may change when I get up there, but if somebody has plans for it and they're looking for it for one and, and I can, I can do that. I'd rather, I'd feel better. They're, they're kind of rare. And, uh, and this is this is just an absolutely beautiful camera. So um, if and I got a silver tank with it, I got everything. It's ready to go. All you do is buy glass or substrate. In fact, I've probably I probably have 20 sheets of tin type uh, aluma type uh, test plates. I don't have. I have got a couple of sheets of glass, but it's ready to go. It's a beautiful. I think it's a 550. It's a 55 centimeter Deroji F4 on it. It's 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 absolutely stunning. Do I have? Well, hold on. Let me show you something. It's a terrible plate, but um, this is all beat up. It's one of my test plates, I think. But here's here's the lens. Let me see if I can blow this up. Here's a here's an old one that I didn't varnish. Beautiful lens. Uh, it doesn't show the detail in this, does it? It's all beat up. I, I just found these. I'm finding all kinds of photographs around here, but you can see it's a it's a big it's a monster. Look at look at this is what happens when you don't varnish. See that? Look at her different color in her face. But anyway, so that's what I'm thinking about, guys. Um, I love it. I just uh, I'll probably regret it if I do sell it, but uh, but right now that's where I'm at. So things may change. Guys, thank you so much. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you listening to me. Have a great day. Stay safe. Stay set, healthy. And I'll see you next. I'll see you next Saturday, I hope. Ciao, brothers, ladies. Bye-bye.